Rethinking Possible is a presentation of Covenant Exchange in partnership with Rare Gem Productions. Hosted on the Inspiration Networks of OneRareGem.com. Uniquely positive. Learn more at O N E R A R E G E M.com. Hello, everyone. How are you? Thank you for locking in to Rethinking Possible. I am your host, Nikki Roach, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Always a pleasure to dig a little deeper than we normally do in our normal lives with people that we meet. And this is the platform for that. So I always have to give kudos and thanks to my sister, Jade Harrell and Rare Gems for all the wonderful things in the platform that they're providing to give you some listening pleasure and some instruction along the way as we all find our purpose as we rethink possible. Well, today I am beyond honored and might I even add blessed to have in the studio with me, Mr. Roosevelt Mitchell the third. And just a little background, Mitchell was born without two bones in his right arm and three fingers on his right hand. So his right arm is shorter than his left, and he only has a thumb and an index finger on his right hand. Yeah, think about that. And I'm sure already you see where I'm going in regards to rethinking possible and why I'm going to do all I can to not cry today on this show. But oh my goodness. So this brother is a special education teacher with St. Louis Public School Districts. He is an author, motivational speaker, and he is determined to use his experience of thriving in spite of what you will call a disability to teach adults how to cope with life's challenges and quote, unquote, and you see my little fingers moving, normal children, how to treat children with disabilities. And I love the fact that I just said you think is a disability because it is through disability that God uses us to be extraordinary people and to show what you thought couldn't be done. Come on now. Who's really rethinking possible at this point? So at this moment, we're going to take a little brief pause for the calls and come right back with Roosevelt to hear his story on Rethinking Possible. One thing could throw you completely off balance. Speaking as an individual with a mental illness, when you get up in the morning, you can start off having a very bad day. It can just take a small thing and it affects everything you do for that day. And possibly you might miss a medication you know, or take it too late, that causes problems. You might not feel well otherwise, and that affects your mental health. It might be raining, and that affects your mental health. So all the things that other people kind of take for granted, people with mental illness struggle with. But it doesn't have to take you down. Take it on one piece at a time. Take five. And some of the keys to success with that is that you have to learn about your predictable, and yes, they are predictable emotional responses. You have to educate yourself, and we have have to restore balance in our lives when this happens. Be determined to bounce back. Take care of your mental health just like you would anything else. Be alive and well. Find out more about what you can do to bounce back. Go to aliveandwellstl.com. Rare Gym Productions proudly presenting the positive. Roosevelt Mitchell III, how are you? How you doing? Good. Thank you so, so much for having me. I am so excited to have you here in the studio with me. It's truly, truly an honor. Good. What's interesting, I heard you are up for Teacher of the Year. Is this true? I am, man. Uh, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and I tell people that uh, I can't take no credit for I give all the glory to God. because yeah. uh, Wait a minute now. I think that uh, teaching is not a profession for me, but it's a vocation. Wow. You know, wow. so it's truly, truly a blessing to be in a place where I can be effective and an inspiration to others. Wonderful. And I know you're just coming off of a couple speaking engagements here in, in St. Louis. And so the momentum and the word is out all about the books and the T-shirts and thanks for the goodies and examples and samples and all that you brought today. Don't expect them back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're all yours. No, I'm just kidding. But let's jump right in. Tell us who you are and your story. Well, my story is one, I think, of, of many people's, but who doesn't have the a voice to be heard to tell it. So again, I'm very, very spiritual. So I think it's my purpose to tell the things that I've been through mm -hmm. so many people can relate to them and also know that uh, all things are possible. But I grew up in a one-parent household. My mother left when I was seven years old, and I wouldn't see her again until I was in my 20s. 
So my father raises five of us, a single dad, didn't even have a high school diploma. He was on disability. So, you know, he eventually ended up being on drugs. So it was a struggle to just have a bare necessity. So I've been without and every summer we didn't have any hot water. So we have to boil water and couldn't take showers during the summer. And, wow. You know, so going through that and then ultimately my senior year, my family had up and left and moved my grandparents with whom I was staying with. So I was left homeless. So I was, at the time I was a captain of the football team. I was a national honor society. I was vice president of student government. And I ended up telling my football coach like, Hey man, I'm going to quit school. He was like, what you mean you're going to quit? I said, I don't have nowhere to live, man. Uh, School's not that important. You know, I just need to survive, you know? So, Fortunately, by the grace of God, one of my classmates' parents, they told me to come live with them, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. So I went from literally shaking, you know, roaches off my clothes and rats and from that environment to a middle-class environment till we had a maid, and first time I ever got lunch money, and we eating dinner as a family, so I had to get used to it. But that ultimately showed me how I wanted to support my family, you know, so and actually, I created a, a scholarship for him. This was the first year I created a scholarship called the Mark and Rebel Dugan Scholarship for a high school senior back in my former high school. Wow. And a condition was for them to write an essay after they become successful. How are they going to give back? Because I truly believe it's not about the American dream. Society tells you about the American dream, about your own personal dream of your own house, your own car, your own success. But it's ultimately about giving to others. You know, and I truly believe that we bless with a lot so we can help others. Right, right. And many times we fail to realize no matter what's going on, as long as we stay focused on Mm -hmm. what it is that we really want. And Mm -hmm. and then I probably need to back up and say having tapped into that purpose, because despite all that you had going on, there was something that had your eye in your heart. Because right. you could have easily not even mentioned that you were going to drop out of school. So even something within you caused you to fight. What do you think that was? Well, again, as I look back on it, it was nothing but, you know, something spiritual. Because mm-hmm. uh, at my lowest points in my life or moments, I received my greatest blessings. Wow. And I remember those nights just laying there by myself and didn't know, you know how I was going to eat or anything like that. And my family wasn't answering the phone for me, so I was just on my own. But then, it, you know, it was only by the grace. And after that, I wish I could sit here and tell you, after that, I went to college and everything just been great, but I still have my trials since then. And uh, going to college, I was the first one to go to college, and I just went just to get away from that environment. So that wow. pushed me. But I was always, you know, me and my mother rec- uh, reconnected uh, after years of not speaking and me feeling negative feelings toward her because I felt like she abandoned us. But, you know, she told me this story. The last time we lived together, 1989, I was seven years old and we lived in Milwaukee. She said, son, she told me this a couple years ago. She said, son, I always knew you was going to be the one to make it. I always knew you was going to be the one to make it because when I used to be hungover or drunk and I didn't get up, you would get yourself up at seven years old, dress yourself and walk to school on your own. Wow. You know, so I think it was always a hand guiding me, you know, even at an early age. You know, until now, you know, until now, I'm just, you know, basking in my purpose, Mm -hmm. I believe. So many people listening, I'm including myself because I'm listening as you're talking. We can become paralyzed by the smallest things in life. I'm talking smallest things. And see, I had to step away for a moment because I had to get myself together. What is it that you do or that? you could even dive into giving a nugget on rethinking possible to someone. How is it that you maintain emotional wellness and mental wellness? And that's a great question. Emotional wellness and mental wellness, I believe comes from a sense of self, right? It wasn't until it's hard to, people always use the term love yourself. Yeah. It's hard to love. Loosely, right? Loosely, right? Because it's hard, but it's hard to love yourself. Fully, if you don't know yourself fully, so you can only love yourself just as it only equates to the amount that you know yourself. So once you become real with yourself and understand who you are and the tools you have given and what you're good at and what you're not good at, then I think it's better to accept yourself. Now, I say that because after my speeches, 
a lot of people with disabilities come up and, you know, and thank me and tell me they wish they had the courage to say the things that I say or just be out in public and not be ashamed of who I am. But I share with them. It was years and years of me having to, you know, cringe. And every time I looked in the mirror, I not want to see myself in the mirror because I felt different. Right. Yeah. Which is why I wrote the book. Caden is different, mm -hmm. you know, to teach disability at a younger age. But I think in learning myself and understanding who I am and I was put here for a specific purpose and God doesn't make any mistakes. None. Right. So None. I was made like this for a reason. Yeah. And so you don't know this, but my father, um, who is magnificent, his daughters, you know, most of us should probably think. <laughs> right, right, right. So he is in a wheelchair, has been for years, lost his walking one morning. Wow. And it's not a form of muscular dystrophy. It's not a form of muscular sclerosis, but it's in between. So they've been doing tests, but there's no cure for it. So at that time, he's in a school teacher in okay. one of our school districts here. He's president of the teachers union, janitors union, had a cake business, wow. um, doing speaking engagements. He was singing with a gospel group that traveled all over the world and was starting ministry. Wow. And this is right when he started to, you could tell something was going on, but we didn't know what it was because his walk, everybody just thought he walked cool, but it was, he was losing it. And one day it was just gone. And, I'm listening to you and I'm bringing this up because I know some of the story or the things that a person goes through with, as we call it, disability, how it affects the family and the people you're around. Right. But my right. father, he began to pull back on some things because he felt as if he was a burden right. to my mother and I and the family. And he went through a season where he had to literally, someone had to pick him up and put him on the stool because he was starting to get more and more speaking engagements, but he was embarrassed. So he didn't want to take those engagements. Right. And then something went off because he began to get even more engagements and more invitations, not just in St. Louis, but right. around throughout the U S and because of that, I am a fighter. Mm -hmm. So I know you have way more to share, but, because of you being here, I am now strengthened in my fight, mm, just glad. to let you know that. So what is it, support-wise, that you have experienced that has supported you in your success? Well, in my speeches, I say I am, I begin it, and I say I am who I am because someone loved me. You know, someone kept track of wow. me. The family who took me in. The greatest thing they did for me wasn't taking me in. It was keeping track of me over the years because they was the only people who showed up at my college graduation. Wow. They was the only people every year that, you know, they still send me a birthday card. That, you know, we still spend Christmas together. We still spend Thanksgiving together. So them just keeping track of me, I think, is important because in turn, what keeps me going, you know, whenever I want to give up or have those down moments is wanting to make them proud of me. Wow. Right. You know, I want to be, you know, someone they can be proud of as well as my children. Right. So that's what keep me going. But I think that one of the best things that happened is and at the time I didn't know it. But hindsight is me being left alone, because in that I've learned not to lean on other people or, you know, any earthly person, you know, anybody here, but to lean more on my spirituality. Yeah. Right. So I don't look for people to do things for me. Right. So. I think that's what's getting me, you know, my support, you know, comes from above and he provides it. So you go to college, you graduate. I heard you say you graduate. Mm -hmm. And then tell us what unfolds after that. What unfolds after that, I graduated. I, I always wanted to be a basketball coach. So I was back. I was a basketball coach. and oh, Wonderful. And uh, I was a school teacher. And then I ended up getting married and moving to South Dakota. My ultimate goal was always to be a college basketball coach. But once I became a college basketball coach, for some reason, it didn't feel the way I thought it would feel. <laughs> but I applaud you because you did it. Right. But I said, this doesn't feel like how I thought it would feel. Interesting. But at that point, and that was a life changing moment, or as Oprah say, an aha moment. <laughs> 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 because right then, something just hit me and just said, your life is too valuable for you to be selfish with it and live it on your own. Live, uh -huh. live your life helping somebody else. So from then on, you know, I changed my prayer to, you know, let me find my purpose. 
And from then, I would have never thought that I would be an author, I'd be a speaker, or I'd write articles, or I'd be the disability scholar, or right? So then I had none of those thoughts. It was just that prayer, you know, ultimately changed. So you mentioned a detour. Give us a little bit more about what comes next. Right. Well, as I mentioned, I went to South Dakota, and, you know, I ended up, you know, finding or searching for purpose, and I got my master's degree out there, and then I ended up getting divorced. And I had two little babies. So that was a huge bump in the road, a huge life changing event. But from that, ultimately, I decided I began writing articles and I began to come into what I want to do for a living. And that's. And what, what made you start writing articles? Well, because what were you writing about? You were coaching, I, right? <laughs> so, right. So how did that shift come about? Oddly, <laughs> <laughs> my competitive nature, because oddly, I just picked up a newspaper, the St. Louis American one day, and I said, you know what? I can write an article uh, just as good as this. And I told my friends at work, and they laughed at me. i never forget it. They laughed at me. Because, okay, you're you're coaching basketball, well, and now you want to. Well, I was coaching, and then I moved back to St. Louis, and then I was working for Department of Mental Health. So we was in a break room. And now you want to write. Really? Right. I just picked it up, <laughs> and I said, right. <laughs> I said, I can write an article just as good as this, and nobody believed me, right? So first article I wrote, and uh, I still have it. I have it framed. It got oh, published. I love it. It got published, and... Uh, we was in the break room one day eating, and, you know, they didn't tell me. I just happened to see myself in the paper, and I passed it around. Then all of a sudden, those people who was laughing wasn't laughing anymore. Ah, right? see? <laughs> <laughs> right. So then I just started writing, and then that kind of, you know, put a taste in my mouth to where I said, wow, I may be pretty good at this. So then I just started writing more and more. And then I was pursuing a second master's degree, and they was talking about, we read this book about autism and but it was written by someone who didn't have autism so i said well you know i'm tired of people writing about disability who doesn't have a disability wow. because you can't write it about insight so again my competitive spirit i said i can write a book just as good as this <laughs> <laughs> so but, i set out to write a book but i love it because again i know listen audience i know you have heard me say this over and over it's interesting how every place that we are positioned right is moving us forward on the pathway to our purpose we have to stop being so frustrated and aggravated yet yeah, now let me back up because some things we put ourselves not the stuff we put ourselves in not those it, crazy issues but understand even this I love that you're saying this competitive nature and the whole I'm sure there are so many lessons even if we had the time that you learn from even being the coach right. that are transferable skills. Right. But had you not experienced that, you would not be, be the bomb, prepared. the boss that I, you I, are today, you know? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so now you're writing, you take the mindset, okay, how is someone going to write about something they don't even experience? Exactly. And hey, let me go ahead and put the pen to the paper in, from my perspective. Exactly. Exactly. And it was truly soul searching. And in right in that process, because I never had written a book, I was from poverty, from the project, so I never knew any writers or academics. So I began to watch a lot of YouTubes of wow. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, Dr. Cornell West, and all those guys. So, and then I started reading like a book a day. I went to the library and I was reading like a book a day, just trying to you know find out the flow and how they structured their chapters and things of that nature. So then I just started writing. And at first, you know, I was nervous because I didn't know how my product will be received, right? Mm -hmm. But it's amazing that the gift you're given once you're in it, I mean, you know how it is received. You know, I received so many good reviews and it's actually, uh, that book called Diary of Disability Scholar is actually in, uh, it's in Southeast Missouri State University. They sell in a bookstore. Um, so they sell in a bookstore. It's in their library. It's in SLU, African American Library. Wow. I've, it's in uh, Linden Woods. It's in Harry Stowe's. And I actually received mm, a letter from Harvard on University. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from Harvard? From okay. Harvard. It's in Harvard, uh, African American Research Library. Wonderful. Yep. Look so, at this. And believe it or not, I had people to tell me, man, you're writing this book, but uh, this book will never make it out the state of Missouri. Nobody ever read it. And, you know, you have all, and that's another lesson for all the listeners. When you're in your purpose or on your path, if you don't have any people who are trying to negate you from it or knock you off course, then you may not be on the right path because mm -hmm. there's always going to be somebody in the way or something in the way. Yeah, and it's how bad do you want it? And if it's purpose, you're going to push. You're going to push. 
It doesn't matter what. Yes. Yeah, because you feel it. It's just not in your mind, but it's in your heart. Yes. I felt that book. Yeah. Right. So even now, I'm working on. Uh, I have three books coming out. Oh. October the first for really? Disability Awareness Month. Really. Yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> Three at the same time. Uh, three on the same day, yes. You know, yeah. see, so, I have no excuses. None. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed to like, well, Nikki, you no. know. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, Nikki, none. <laughs> <laughs> How bad do you want it? <laughs> oh, oh you using me? you using it back on me now? No. How bad do you want it? I, I mean, I tell people that because people who I was asking for guidance when writing my first book, now they look at me like, wow, you doing all this? So I have the next installments to my diary of Disability Scholar and uh, the Cadence is different. And October is Disability Awareness Month. So uh, I'm setting up a disability tour to where I'm speaking at like 10 universities. And I'm doing four book signings. Oh, wonderful. And I'm actually having all three of those books being released October the 1st. So I think, so, I, so right, so I'll do some unprecedented. So, okay. So you're still teaching. Yes. And you're teaching. Tell us a little bit about teaching. What's a typical day for you in the classroom? I teach special education uh, at a special education school, Gateway Michael. And shout out to my principal, Patrick Baker. Hey, Patrick. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I have such a great support system there as well. And I teach during the day. I get up. Well, my day typically I get up 4 to 430 because I have to write before I go to work. So then I have to be at work at 745. Excuse me. Keep going. Right. I have to get up at 745. I have uh, work so I, to do. That's so I go, <laughs> I go at 745, and I'm usually out by 315, and then I'm working on my doctorate full time. So if I don't have class, I'm heading home to my office to write, or I also work for or do videos and work for uh, yourblackworld.net okay. and financialjuneteenth.com to where I'm their uh, educational expert. Okay. So I interview uh, people about educational topics and things of that nature. So I just... It's truly, truly a purpose for me because it doesn't feel like work, right? I work 18, 19 hour days and it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. That's how you know you're in a divine space. Right. Yeah. So when you began to find yourself now in this space of being an author, Mm -hmm. what was one surprise for you? Something that you weren't necessarily prepared for? Well, in my first book, I was completely inexperienced. So I was the writer's block. Right. Because I would sit down. I got to a point to where I was getting up at three in the morning and starting to write. I mean, and I would write to my eyes get blurred. But like I would sit there from three in the morning to one in the afternoon and only write two paragraphs. And I'm sitting there like, wow, this is all I can come up with. Right. <laughs> so but for me, it's more spiritual. Right. Or like Jay-Z says when he goes in the studio, he says, you know, you find the right artist with the right beat, then you crack the door and let God in. So that's how, ah. where I was. You know, I cracked the door. I have, you know, I have my music playing and I'm sitting in front of the screen. I just let God in and I'm led by a spirit. So if I don't feel it, I don't force it. So okay. that was the, the patience part of it. Okay. Because at first I thought I can write a book in like a month, but that proved to be untrue. Right. Going back to, I can do this, you know, and it's like, oh, there's so much. It's so much, right. But that competitive spirit ah. won't allow me to quit. It won't allow me to give up. Right. And that's been a recurring theme through my life. Even with my disability, I just practice more than anybody else or than everybody else. So that's why I was the athlete of the year, my senior year, because I played three sports. I, I love it. I received scholarships for football and track in college, you know, but that's just come from pure worth ethic, not God given ability, just, you know, working harder than people. Right. So because it's no, nothing just comes. Nothing. And that's one thing I have learned. You don't just find people who are experts no they'd put in the work to become an expert exactly. you put in the work to become a great leader versus a good leader you put in work to be a great author who's now touring 10 different cities that's work that's behind work. the scenes it doesn't just happen overnight it doesn't and that's another thing i thought it happened overnight yeah. first, <laughs> i thought it just happened yeah because you don't hear enough like this platform, you don't hear you enough don't hear about it. the ba- what it took to even get here uh-uh. um, because there's some rethinking talking about rethinking possible. There is some rethinking that must happen along the way for you. I love the fact that you mentioned you always wanted to be a basketball coach, but it didn't feel right. It did. So you had to rethink what was possible for you. I had to rethink and reshape and break old habits. And also Dr. Miles Monroe says he used an analogy of apple seed. He said, uh, do you ever see apple trees taking apples to people? He said, no. You know, the people come to the apple tree because that's the apple tree's gift. But 
an apple seed on concrete is still an apple seed, but it won't grow to its greatest potential because it's in the wrong soil. Mm-hmm. So as people, we have to be in the right soil, meaning we have to be in our right purpose wow. in order to become you know, what we all created to be. And that's why, as you mentioned earlier, people are frustrated in their specific path because a lot of times they're choosing the wrong path. Because it seemed like once I got into this arena, the speaking start happening, the ideas for it. I just wanted to write one book. Yeah. I just had, you know, my competitive spirit was one book. But now I have books. Now I have T-shirts. Now I have another three books coming out. Now I have different articles. So everything just happened. So I finally feel like I'm in the right soil. So I'm just Jesus also. Let's just put it out there. <laughs> and what's interesting, just you mentioned putting yourself basically Put yourself in the way to be used. Yes. At the end of the day. But it's like in the right space at the right season. You can't force it. it can't, it's not going to happen overnight. But putting yourself in that. Because who would have thought 10 years ago, 20 years ago, who would have thought you would be producing all that you're producing at this point? Not even 10 years ago. Uh, my first article was published for Black History Month, February 2013. I hadn't even been at it, you know, that long. So the people who saw me start and where I'm at now is truly, truly phenomenal. Yeah, so I just start writing. Wow. Then, you know, my first article. So it, it's it been a little bit over two years, and now I've amassed all this along with numerous articles. And, and the gigs all over the place. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let's talk about yes. Kaden is different. Um, Kaden is different is about a young boy with physical disabilities identical to Mitchell's. It gives parents, educators, and anyone else interested in teaching normal children how to have some compassion for children with disabilities and a platform to discuss disabilities, not just in October, which we mentioned that is Disability Awareness Month, but at all times. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about the book and how it came about and what's next with what? this series. It, it um came about, I was in one of my doctorate classes and one guy, he is a elementary principal. He said, man, I read your first book, but it's for the college level. He said, you should write a children's book that helps us uh, talk about disability at the elementary level. So a light bulb just went off. And I never uh-huh. thought about a children. Book. And the competitive spirit came back. Competitive, no. <laughs> competitive juices start flowing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it was just on my mind. And when God puts something on my mind, I can't shake it. So it was on my mind. I went to sleep. I dreamed about it. I got up. It's still on my mind. I said, well, I hear you, Lord. I got to put this down. So the character, and it seemed like everything just worked out because the character, uh, I made him in my image, which he has seven fingers, but I named him after my son, whose name is Kaden. Okay. And then... Again, I speak about the book. I speak about the things I went through or the way I was bullied where kids didn't want to play with me because they thought I couldn't play because I was different and how they laughed at me or how the girls didn't want to be around or scared of me as well. So it's actually my story that I'm telling. And that's why I can tell it so passionately and so insightfully. But again, what was so grand about it was the point that after I published it, I started my own publishing company, a Disability Scholar Publishing. After I published it, I sold like over 500 copies in like the first 60 days to different school. Di- uh, wow. The book is in every elementary school in St. Louis Public School District. The special school district has orders copies. It's in two uh, universities. Their child development center has ordered some. And uh, I'm actually in talks with Sam's Club. They want to order some copies and have me come and uh, hold a book sign in there. Wonderful. So it's truly, truly moving. And the next one is called Caden is Different. Caden Goes to School. And I talk about how he goes to school and the different things that he encounters at school within a school setting. And again, that'd be out October 1st along with the, and I can see this activity book. Yeah. I I, I can so see this in so many facets. I mean, uh, just a continuous series. I mean, every topic that Caden would experience being a child, like he never has to grow up because there's just way too many topics to cover. So you have some work ahead. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. It's just amazing. So, Kading is different. I see this just as a series. Not There's just so many topics that you can cover with this idea mm-hmm. and this concept. And it is so needed because one thing, it's not just about Kaden and how he is navigating through life, but also how those talked about the support mm-hmm. are educated through the process, um, how educators 
are educated through the process. I mean, it's just on and on and on. What do you have in mind? Do you have some other stuff in mind for Caden? Yes, I have. Again, we had the next book coming out October 1st, and me and my graphic design artist, we're trying to put together a Caden is Different cartoon. Oh, wow. You know? So we, uh, we're trying to get the financing and all that stuff together so we can hopefully – put that together and then shop it around to some networks to see if they'll pick it up. I'm so glad that we're doing this today because, <laughs> huh, I would have to like call you from London or somewhere, you know, um, or I'm, I'm I sorry, so. I would have to meet you there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to call you. Um, and this also, is amazing. Also, I'm working on a Cadence different dial to start licensing that, you know, so I can sell like the book series along with the dial. Wow. Yeah. So I have a large vision for Caden. This is truly a ministry. Yes. yes, Not definitely. just something that you enjoy. Yeah. I am beyond fascinated. So you talked about your doctorate and you're in yes. school. Let me just first applaud you for all the things that you are holding down Thank at you. the same Thank time you. and still birthing out during, you know, some different parts of this big picture dream. What's after the doctorate? Actually, what's your, your area of study for your doctorate? Education administration. OK. What you going to do with that? I have uh, an ultimate goal of hopefully starting my own school one day and uh, wow. like my own leadership academy. Okay. Because, again, our young African-American men don't have too many mentors or role models in there. It's too many of them falling by the wayside. Or just like I read in the newspaper the other day, uh, one school was only graduating 60 percent of its seniors, which was predominantly black. And that's as an educator who cares about children, that's highly unacceptable. You know, no matter if it was here in Appalachia or deep down in the Delta, you know, that's you know unacceptable. So the legacy I want to leave behind is to create more positive people, create more doers, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to make society better. And even though you are very focused in what your purpose is and what your focus is, um, many times we can get distracted. Yes. By our own thoughts. Yes. Um, considering, oh, someone's already doing something like that. Right. Or, you know, is there really an audience for that? Or like you had mentioned earlier, you're writing, you know, really? Okay. <laughs> what is it that makes you say no? Because my voice and my perspective still needs to be heard. It's funny you say that because before my first book, before publishers said yes, I heard 40 no's. Ah. Of people saying there's no market for this book. It doesn't have enough research and this, this and that and all these excuses. And I kept saying, again, first off is research. I read so many books and I did my research thoroughly. So I spent so many hours at Barnes and Noble and at the library just reading different books. So I knew specifically what wasn't out there. And I knew it was an audience uh -huh. now. But when you create in the market, it's tough because people hadn't seen it before. So, you know, one thing about God when he gives us a vision, the tricky thing about it is we can see it, but can't nobody else see it yeah. because they're not supposed to because it's not their vision And the, oh. until it becomes into fruition. Yes. Right? So yes. we got to stay steadfast in that vision that he gives us. So 40 no's, I got that one yes, and now my book is in Harvard. And I don't even have the grades to get in Harvard. <laughs> but, <laughs> but won't he do it? <laughs> but, but hey, you, like you said, <laughs> right? people don't come. You, you, the tree doesn't take the apples to the people, but... Hey, exactly. they come to the tree, so they, they came to the source exactly to get something that they need. Exactly, and, that is you know, amazing, and that's why I think what the speaking tour, what I'm doing for Disability Awareness Month, is is unprecedented, and I think it's going to be a fantastic thing and a big deal as well. I love, I love that energy. It's going to be a fantastic. I yeah. love it. So there is some other work I believe that you're doing. I'm not as familiar with, but. Foundation? Is yes, that what? I have a uh, okay. Roosevelt Mitchell III Foundation. See what I'm which, saying? Uh, All over the place. <laughs> I love it. It's for kids. Well, its purpose is to get more people with disabilities in mainstream media. Meaning, okay. as a kid growing up or as kids grow, grow up, it's hard for them to have a sense of self or high self-esteem if they never see themselves on TV. You have all these television shows, but if a kid doesn't see someone like him, then he thinks or feels that something is wrong with him. Or he feels different. And right. And that's the way I felt growing up until I mean, again, it took me years to even, you know, want to look in the mirror because, you know, people don't understand your differences. But just like what's going on right now with the LGBT 
rights and things of that nature. Every time you cut the TV on, you see a gay couple. What they're doing, they're normalizing it. So and keeping it in our face, exactly. So where so diversity, so it looks normal. yes, and right. and so diversity and inclusion comes in. I mean, that's just huge. That's broad, and this is one area one I will say that is not talked about enough in right. mainstream. In mainstream, right? In mainstream, so right? If we can get just. Somebody with a physical disability on our favorite shows like Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder, or uh, what's the other show? Go with to Lucius? the top. I love it. Uh, Empire. Uh, yeah, Empire with Lucius. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and and I love the fact that they did tap on it because um, they've tapped on they a tap number on. of different things. Exactly. So if we can just ease that more in there and yeah. put it, you know, put that in the face of people and normalize it to where people don't is it's not like a culture shock to people. Then I think. Kids growing up there have a better sense of self knowing that, okay, I can do anything. Right. Because, you know, you know, I can be the next Tyler Perry or the next Oprah Winfrey because I've seen somebody else, you know, I've seen Roosevelt do it. Or I've seen him do it. So I try to be an example for many people. Right? Wonderful. So right now we're raising money to shoot our first documentary about highlighting that cause. And then next we're going to tap into some different issues. Wow. As well. So it's truly, truly a blessing. What is it that you know now? You wish you had known two years ago. You know, I'm one of those type of people who uh, everything happens for a reason. And God takes us on a specific path. It's hard for me to say that because I think all the things I went through was essential in becoming the person that I am in the place that I am today. But if I had to pick one thing, it would be <laughs> don't take things so personal. I used to take stuff so personal and it stopped my productivity because I'd be upset at somebody or something like that. But I, I've learned this laser-like focus by not taking things so personal, right? So if you do something to me, I used to feel bad about it. Like, I can't believe she did that to me. Mm-hmm. Why should I feel any type of way about what you've done when I have no control over you, right? That's your problem. That's not mine. You know, I just keep marching. I just keep pressing forward. And I let you carry that weight. So I think that, you know, hindered my progress a lot. So I'm to the point to where now, even though I'm moving out of, fast pace I still feel like I'm playing catch up wow so you are doing what um, many of us find ourselves doing these days which is dual careering it Mm -hmm. so you have your daytime gig you have your purpose Mm -hmm. (laughs) not to take anything away from the daytime gig because that truly equips us with resources and networks and all of that how would you recommend someone manage that dual career action that you're experiencing right now? Be a great steward of your time. You know, it all starts with your time. You know, if you sleep eight hours a day, if you sleep eight hours a day and then you work eight hours a day, you know, that's 16 hours. It's only 24 hours in a day. So and then, you know, you factor in your dinner, you're talking on the phone and your chilling time. You might have three or four hours left to work on your purpose or your goals. So. Again, you know, I don't sleep eight hours, right? Because that's time that I can work, right? So I don't sleep eight hours and I try to cut out all the excessive phone talking and the chilling time. I mean, I've gone weeks and weeks without even cutting on my television just because I have no time for it, just because I need to be productive. So, you know, a dual vocation is doable if you just be a great steward of your time. Interesting. So I know at this point, the curiosity, how can you get in touch with, with Mr. Mitchell. Okay, that's easy. <laughs> that's, that's easy. DisabilityScholar.com is my website, and it has all of my products, my books, T-shirts, and all that good stuff, as well as uh, you can donate to my foundation on there as well. and Or you can email me at DisabilityScholar at Gmail. Or follow me on Twitter, at Disabled Scholar. Or on Facebook, at Disability Scholar. Or Disability Scholar. And... Do you have anything coming up soon that people can attend or follow you? Yes, I have. Well, nothing local. I'm speaking at a career day at the end of this month, but it's in Mayfield, Kentucky. Okay. And I have to check my well, calendar. Well, in Mayfield, May- yeah, go ahead. and. I have to check my calendar. Uh, it fills up so fast now. I mean, it's truly a blessing, mm. but it fills up so fast. <laughs> I just got to look at it. <laughs> but I think uh, the only thing that's sticking out in my mind is, you know, is the Mayfield, Kentucky. I believe that's at the end of the month. Okay, okay. And I just want to say thank you so, so very much. Before we swing up out of here, I always close out with, if you had the platform, which currently right now you do, to tell the world one thing they need to remember or consider as they rethink possible for their own personal life, 
what would that one thing be? One thing, just one thing to rethink possible is to know that anything is possible and the sky isn't the limit. There are no limits. You know, as long as you, you know, keep your faith and press forward and faint not. So that's what I would tell them. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for being so transparent, so personable. And really, the sky is the limit for you. Thank you for showing us how to fight. Thank you for showing me, even at this moment, what resiliency looks like in the flesh. So thank you. And in a suit. (laughs) (laughs) Looking awfully nice, right? (laughs) I applaud you on all that you've done. Thank you for the tokens. And I'm looking forward to sharing and I'm telling everybody about your story. Thank Um, you so much. I'm looking really forward to that. I know this won't be our last time connecting. Sure won't. (laughs) I'm so grateful for having Roosevelt Mitchell III, author, educator, and speaker. I'm in the studio with me. Make sure you go out and find Caden is Different, the activity book, as well as just the standard book in your local stores. If you don't see it, make sure you request it. Again, you've been listening to Rethinking Possible. I am your host, Nikki Roach. Don't forget, you already possess everything you need to be successful. Let's do this. It's a wrap. Show some love. Rethinking Possible is a presentation of Covenant Exchange in partnership with Rare Gem Productions. If you'd like to be on the show, have questions about any of our guests, please visit Nikki Roach at NikkiRoach.com. N-I-C-C-I-R-O-A-C-H.com. Rethinking Possible is another positive production of Rare Gem Productions. Thanks for listening.